Hello everybody, and welcome to another edition of Magic Mics. Today we're talking about dead keywords, new keywords, we're talking about some serious stuff, we're talking about some salty stuff, we're going to be talking about some splash damage as Magic wakes his way into other forms of media and other media outlets. And lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about what may, may be coming to a theater near you. So I'm going to come right into the first pick, which is the hottest thing happening in Magic, but I will start with in introducing my co-hosts, which is Ruben Pressler. Hello. And, and Aaron Campbell. Hi guys. So we want to kick off the broadcast with talking about the new keywords, the loss of keywords, the new spoilers, the keywords such as menace. This is the goblin war drums ability. This is the can only be, only be blocked by two or more creatures ability. How do we feel about this new this new mechanic, this new keyword rather? Who are we starting with? Go Should for I it. Go first? Ruben, go. <laughs> well, um, the first the first thing that that comes to mind is that I'm I'm happy that every every year they sort of review what can be replaced and keep the game fresh and new and make sure that there's there's nothing that's sort of outlived its welcome. Mm -hmm. um, I'm super excited that Scry is going to be in every set. I like that Prowess is now an evergreen mechanic. And Menace really fits. I like the name Menace for the ability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the first card that I remember seeing what's now Menace on, um, for me personally, was uh, Imposing Visage. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the card Imposing Visage that has the goblin that's kind of doing this? I always pronounce it um, visage. But visage. Visage. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, yeah, man, all the way back from Ice Age, fifth edition. Yeah, man. That 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 <laughs> art was always stuck with me. It's also in Goblin War Drums, and I think it's long overdue. This this ability has been on a, a a card pretty much every set or two, uh, for a long time. So, um, I, and I really like the name uh, that they've used for it. Um, I'm very excited about the new prowess creature. That's basically a, a, an Ophidian. Uh, with with prowess and that really fits as well. So uh, right, you know, to talk about the menace mechanic for a bit, it's also on the card Boggart Brute, and there's some other cards right. like Leaf Gilder that's been spoiled, and it's like, oh, Lorwin, can we go back to Lorwin? Can we yeah. please go back to Lorwin? Oh man. Well, there's going to be ten home worlds in Magic Origins. Right. So Lorwin will be one of them, right? Because one of the Planeswalkers left their home world and got to Lorwyn or started on Lorwyn and, and left to go somewhere else, I would assume. Did yeah, there's, um, some, there's some flavor text that makes reference to boggarts or goblins, so that's okay. not out of the realm of possibility. Right. Nice. And I'm totally okay with that because I'm ready to go back to Lorwyn. I love Lorwyn. Just give me a Muldrift. Just give a Muldrift from my life. <laughs> Bring it. I want a Shriek Maw. not on the list of new keywords. That are <laughs> no. Don't that makes excited. me sad. But so after the can only be blocked by two or more, we begin with uh, Prowess as an evergreen mechanic, uh, which I think is terrific. You were talking about Jesse and Thief, which is literally Ophidian's cost. Uh, and literally Ophidian's uh, power and toughness, but now it has prowess, which is super powerful. I love playing with prowess. I loved how it gave gave Blue a and a, a sort of aggressive slash um, uh, slash um, combat mechanic in ways that it never had before, and now it does. That's super awesome. Aaron, how do you feel about that? I'm I like prowess because I feel like for a while there in course that's the default blue strategy which is play a lot of flyers and I mean that definitely works there's nothing wrong with that but mm -hmm. you know I appreciate how they give colors more to do um, they've also been making a push for red to have this um this draw mechanic where you can exile cards and then cast them on your turn like they're giving red more to do mm -hmm. and I really like when they flesh out colors and they don't just keep them you know in the same patterns that we we've known them to have for so long and I think prowess is a really intelligent mechanic and and like scry it really does rely on the player to make the most of it and there are some players who can use prowess really really well and then there are others who kind of stumble with it and I I like seeing prowess in the hands of a good player you know I think it was uh you know I think blue needed something because they don't they don't really get anything you know yeah. blue blue never gets anything they don't, oh, they don't control <laughs> own everything. Yeah, they don't They don't have all of the pieces of the pie. It's not like blue gets to draw cards, which everything is a card. I'm bounce a... permanence, which almost everything is a permanent. Or counter spells, which literally everything is a spell. So, so yeah, that... it's, it's good for them to have a wider range than they already have. Hey, Ruben. <laughs> yeah, what's up? That's the joke. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to go find that Simpsons image, you know? I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just send That's it to you. That's joke. Yeah, that was the yeah. Joke. The fact that that you know, Ophidian is uh, such a iconic card from Magic's past, and now you have Ophidian, but instead of pay zero, don't deal any damage. Right. You have a a triggered ability that makes it deal more damage. 
I just like that magic has evolved to the point where one of the most iconic and highest finishing like creatures at the beginning of magic is completely obsolete at this point. Oh, 100%. And not only obsolete, I mean, they're just like better in basically every aspect. And yeah. I love it. Um, so Scry is the last one that they basically said is now evergreen because we've seen Scry a lot. It's really sweet. Uh, they, uh, on at least the spoiler sites that, you know, none of this is confirmed, but at least I've seen Titan Strength, uh, which is a really sweet card. I'm glad it's coming back. I'm glad it's going to stay in standard. But, you know, how do we feel about Scry kind of coming back and staying? And it's not going to include Serum Visions because that has, to, set. that has to stay $10, people. Not for this set. <laughs> it's an evergreen mechanic. They can right. bring back Serum Visions when they so choose. Mm -hmm. um, just not, not for... Magic Origins, unfortunately, but uh, Scry as an evergreen mechanic is great. Um, mm -hmm. I, it, it lets them, for example, if they wanted to print a, a cycle of lands, they could just print the temples again, mm -hmm. for example, um, which I which I really like. Scry is an ability that you know is like a third of a card drawn every time you use it. Mm -hmm. I think is something along those lines. Uh, people were playing off color Scry lands in mono black at the end of uh, Standard a couple seasons ago. So I really like Scry. I really like what it does for decks that don't have a bunch of inherent card draw. Um, for example, everything's basically only mountains, like what I run all the time. So uh, <laughs> sure. I'm happy that that's a full-time evergreen mechanic. Aaron, how do you feel about it? I was fine with it. You know, like I said before, I think that scry is something that rewards skill. Like, I still feel like I'm not good at scrying to this day. And maybe it's just because I didn't play a lot of Thero Standard. But I still feel like, you know, when I play a temple, you know, or even when I try you know, other things, even just doing Courser, I still feel like I'm not a master at that. And and again, I feel like there's a noticeable difference between watching Brad Nelson make scry decisions and watching the average, you know, person do it. And it, it I, I like that. Well, there's a big difference in watching any pro play Magic versus watching the average person play you Magic. You know what I well, mean. But I understand what you're saying. I mean, like, yeah. I think the scry lands, you know, because at first they were just like, I can't believe these are rare. What are these people doing? These yeah. cards aren't even very good. And then, like, and R&D was just like, no, seriously, guys. They're really good, and they well, turn out to be fantastic. There was a story that that I'd heard a couple times that Sean McLaren, when he was testing for the standard Pro Tour before the Pro Tour that he won, the modern Pro Tour, mm -hmm. he was playing blue-white control before the blue-white temple came out, I think is what it was, and he was playing off-color temples, and everyone was like, what are you, crazy? And he's like, no, scrying's great! <laughs> and he's the only one, he's the only one that played off-color scrylands in his control deck, and nice. he, you know, did very well at that Pro Tour. And uh, it took people a couple months, uh, a couple months to figure that out. Um, but uh, but he was ahead of the curve on that one. That one. But everyone looked at him like he was a crazy person for that Pro Tour. Um, nice. Yeah, Scrying's great. Um, I, that one's the ability of the three that's going to have the highest tournament play. Obviously, we've seen a ton of Scry already. Uh, unless they really, really push Menace or really, really push. Uh, prowess in a new and different direction. I, I can't imagine we'll see more of either of those mechanics than we will of Scry uh, in Pro Tour and Grand Prix top eights. Right. You know, to be honest, though, I wasn't. I wasn't as enthusiastic about like I didn't have a stake in these abilities coming back I was more interested in the stories behind it where because he literally broke down every core set and I was it was a long post and I remember yeah. just starting from the beginning and walking down you know that road with him and I was more interested in the stories and the what led us to this point that's where I that's where I got interested in this in this news oh I love it I mean like Mero or I'm sorry Morrow as he likes to be called because <laughs> I'm southern deal with it um <laughs> Anyway, Mark Rosewater likes to, uh, you know, likes to really delve into the history of magic and sort of tell you the timeline and give you all the context. And I think that's absolutely brilliant. And that's also sort of brings us to what we are losing, which is Intimidate, which I think had a lot of good intentions, didn't actually kind of work out because of the intuitiveness or the lack of intuity of intuitiveness for the mechanic. Um, Landwalk, which uh, generally sucks um, because you know you never want to be in a position where you're like. I don't want to play this land. I don't want to keep playing magic because then I'm going to make their creature unstoppable and that's bad. And no, you know, you don't want to, you don't ever want to stop, stop playing magic in terms of the game. Um, and lastly, the one that I was really surprised by, which is protection, which I thought, honestly, I was like, I mean, and, and I didn't say they're going to kill it outright. They're just said it's not going to be expected in every set. And there's one, there's one card with it in origins and that's fine. 
but I never really felt it was a problem, and I thought it was a really cool way to sort of thematically show a character, a creature, or whatever, um, you know, even just like even enchantment if they're trying to be weird or whatever, but just to show like this is something that is the polar opposite. This is something that has nothing to do with these other colors. You know, Paladin Onvek has protection from black and protection from red because he is the purest, like the, he's the pure knight. And I thought that was really cool. I thought that sort of showed a lot of things. And just to say like, you know, well, we're not really going to do it as much. And we don't really think it's that good. I was like, I thought it was great. I didn't get it. Well, the problem with protection is similar to a problem that, for example, Animate Dead has. Mm -hmm. You think of the card Animate Dead and you're like, yeah, that makes sense. You have this physical manifestation of a way to reanimate a corpse. Mm -hmm. And if you destroy the physical manifestation, the corpse dies. And if you kill the corpse, the physical manifestation dies. And it makes sense in a D&D &D sort of role-playing way. But mm -hmm. if you try to put it into the rules of magic, it gets really bogged down and complicated. Mm -hmm. And protection is really like that. I spent the better part of my childhood trying to remember the rules to protection. Yeah. Mm. To, to be like, can I do this? Can I do this? What happens if I do this? And the problem is that most everyone doesn't have the time to remember that, well, damage doesn't affect it and enchantments can't go on it and it can't be blocked by those creatures and it can't be targeted by those effects. And so that means this works and this doesn't and Wrath of God kills it, but Wildfire doesn't. And it's like, it's too much. Right. For a player yeah. who's new to the game, sure. something says protection, you would need like a paragraph of reminder text for protection. Um, I like protection. I really again, like you said, thematically, it makes sense. It's the polar opposite of, uh, you know, Paladin Envac has protection from red and protection from black. It's the fighter for all that's good. But it, it, it just doesn't grok to use a term that you like to use a lot uh, there, Evan. It, it, it's not easy to pick up. It's complicated in multiple different types of ways. It's a nightmare for a ju for judge staffs. And in the future, they're going to do more things along the lines of uh, there was an ability in Shadowmoor where there was a cycle of creatures where this creature can't be blocked by red creatures mm -hmm. and can't be the target of blue spells. And they'll do more stuff like that rather than using protection. Uh, sometimes they can use it, which is great, but I'm I'm fine with it leaving. I, I'm okay with protection uh, being put off to the side a little bit uh, in, in favor of simpler uh, um, abilities. Sure. I felt like protection was more noticeable in Theros block where we had mono blue, you know, and you had mono black. And if you were playing mono black, all you had to do was slap down a blood baron of this copa. And if they didn't have Devour Flesh, and even then it was like, well, I'm glad I came to. You know, just, and in that particular block, I felt protection was more harmful. I it think was, I don't know, man. Mono Black, like, now everyone until Theros block, everyone wanted Mono Black control to work. Everybody. They were just like, you know, back yep. in the day, <laughs> we had Cabal Coffers. It was awesome. Do you guys and, remember Mind Sludge? Things were great. Yeah, it was sweet. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, if we could just make Mono Black work. And I, I was one of those people who was always trying to make Mono Black work. And right. finally it works. And it is absolutely miserable. It is miserable. And... Yeah, this is, and so they're going to point to to Gary, to old gray merchant of Asphodel, for the next five to ten years, and just be like, nope, mono black sucks. We need to make it suck, and it should not work. Why? Because it was absolutely miserable when it was good. The mono blue thing just kind of came out of left field, but like I think that really showed that like mono black control is this sweet idea. It always sounds really sweet. It just never works in reality. Don't blame Gary. It's not Gary's fault. Oh, it's, it's Gary's fault. fault. It's not Gary's fault. <laughs> I, I it's think the pa pack rats. It's fault. pack rats. We all fault. know it's the pack rats. Fault. Yeah, it's pack rat for sure. I mean, uh, that they didn't know what they were really getting into with that, and everyone was just a crap common for so long. So, but this also kind of brings us to a conversation about interactivity. Is it about is losing these things, the intimidate and the landwalk and, and most of the protection, about making sure that you're able to do things with your opponent? Is is that where sort of we need to be? Well, the problem I have with that argument is, and I've heard <coughs> I've heard several people bring this up, is you still have hexproof. I mean, you could basically yeah. suit up something to high heaven and swing mm -hmm. for four, six, seven, eight, and you're not really paying much attention to what your opponents are doing because you're just ghost pantsing it. And, you know, it's it's interesting that those things were bad for that reason, for not mm -hmm. being interactive enough, but you will allow this to happen. You will allow indestructible. I believe indestructible is still around. Mm -hmm. That's another one that is not easy to deal with where you can just sort of have something out there and what, you know, what can you really do about that? So um, I'm, I'm curious about that, how one mm -hmm. is okay, but one is not. Ghost Ruben? Pants, by the way, is the name that I danced under in college. <laughs> um, so... 
<laughs> so here's here's the thing. Interactivity, this is a really in- interesting conversation, and I've had yeah. similar conversations. It, they haven't really been um, uh, brought all together, but, you know, is Burn in Modern an interactive deck? Is Hexproof in Modern an interactive deck, or in Standard, or mm-hmm. in or in uh, the Avacyn Pro Tour, that Hexproof deck? Is that interactive? Is Dredge interactive? <sighs> They all have interactive elements to them. All, every single one of them. Dredge has Cabal Therapy that targets an opponent to try to continue their game plan. Burn has burn spells that can point at creatures should they need to. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hexproof has, you know, halfway decent blockers or certain ways that they have to, you know, you, you need this enchantment in order to defeat this deck and you need this ability in order to defeat this deck. Um, they're all interactive in their own way. Um, I think that when people say that they don't like interactivity, what they mean is they don't like the types of interactivity that their opponents choose to use or choose to ignore. Yes. There are some types of interactivity that everyone likes, and then there's some types of interactivity that some people like, and then there's some types of interactivity that fewer people like, but you have them all. You have targeted, you know, some, some people will go bananas if they get their creature counterspelled. But if you Doomblade it after it comes into play, they're completely fine with it. That's and there are people that are the exact opposite. You know, it's, 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 you know, some people like craps and some people like slot machines. Like, they, some people just like their randomness and they like their, their uh, uh, entertainment in different ways. It's, it's to each his own. I don't think that um, you're going to scare off a lot of people if you have... Um, if you have mono black control, for example, where you have these cards like Pack Rat and Thought Seize and Heroes Downfall that have all of the interact, like, well, Pack Rat itself is not super interactive with your opponents, but you have all these <laughs> other interactive elements, Heroes sure. Downfall and Thought Seize in particular, that are uber powerful, but they're also the definition of interactive. Right. I mean, I think ultimately what what uh, and I think what he sort of showed the article for me anyway, serving to sort of get to the spoilers, was that. Um, you know, a lot of the keywords that have come in and come out of Magic, and I love how he just completely glossed over banding. It was great. Um, <laughs> Dude, banding is great. Poor have banding. you ever banded a creature? Yeah. Oh, Honestly, God. have you ever banded a creature in a constructed tournament? It's, it's the best. It's absurd. It doesn't it's matter. So good. But the, the point is that it feels like what he was doing is like, you know, throughout the years, what they what R&D has done has been like, wait a minute, is this actually bad? This could be bad. And then they go... That's totally bad. Let's get rid of it. And Hexproof, like when Hexproof is good, it feels completely miserable. It's just like when Dredge is good, Aaron. And hey, hey you the one decided to invest in it and decide to play some one there of the is, most non-interactive decks that yeah. does exist. Let's turn our there library is, face up and do something that isn't magic. That's what Richard what? Garfield would like. There is nothing wrong with casting Iona on turn one against Burn. That is living, my friend. Send your hate mail to Aaron Campbell, <laughs> pair of Magic Mics. Mm-hmm. One, two, three. The PM bridge box. from below, Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the new spoilers. Now, we talked a little bit already about Jesse and Thief, which I think has the potential of being very good. Um, you know, an Ophidian that you can, you know, work in your spells to make it larger to to increase its size where it doesn't automatically lose in combat. If they take a hit, then you start to draw a card that's very powerful. Um, that, to me, is a, is a pretty sweet, exciting spoiler. Uh, Avaricious Dragon is too many syllables for me. Yeah, that's um, a lot of syllables. It's just, it's just one too many. It's just not really... It's the Bootylicious Dragon. It is the Bootylicious Dragon. Yeah, I want to I wanna make a Weird Al parody of something with that. Just Yeah, my, my dragon's too avaricious for, for you, babe. For you, babe. That's yeah, right. Just... But Grafted Skullcap on a 4-4 four, four flyer for four for Mono Red. Ruben? Yeah. Yeah? Happy. Yeah, last yeah. Weekend, last weekend at the TCG uh, Invitational, I played a deck that had seven dragons in it. I played uh, four Thunderbreak Regents and three Stormbreath Dragons in my Mono Red deck. And though wow. they were sweet, mm. um, and I uh, I like this guy. This guy's pretty great. He's, mm-hmm. you know, Grafted Skullcap's even a card that I played back in the day when I first started playing Magic. I played Grafted Skullcap in like a red blue artifacts Goblin Welder kind of deck. Sure. Um, and Avaricious Dragon is well. First of all, it's a four four flyer for four, which is above the curve. Uh, mm-hmm. y- y- it's 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 you know you you ex- you typically expect to pay five for a four four flyer. Um, Unless it's guy, sort of in the rare mythic range, which this is. Right, which this is. And th- this has definitely been a little bit more pushed. Mm-hmm. Getting to draw an additional card in red 
is not that a thing is. that Red gets a lot of. And that is... Yeah. Right. You've seen... I'm sure that anyone who's ever played against an Outpost Siege has uh, has not been too happy about yeah, it. Yeah, you need to deal with that stat. Yeah, and this is a this is an outpost siege that you don't you don't lose. Well, I guess you lose both cards, but you don't uh, you don't lose tempo. You get to keep playing pressure onto the board. You don't have to take a turn off. You know, a, a lot of the out, uh, outpost siege decks, you're like goblin or, or, or you know dragon fodder, uh, uh, hordling outburst, enchantment that doesn't kill you. Sure. Yep, we did it. But now you have a four four, and now your now your threat base is is a lot is a lot wider. So I am looking forward to playing a lot of copies of this guy. Well, yeah, that's one of the things that made red white so scary when it had its moment in standard was that you were by itself these things were fine. You were like, okay, rabble master, deal with it, and you you know all these things you had to deal with right away, mm -hmm. and you were thinking, well, all I have to do is run them out of cards because they had no way to refresh their cards. Then they play an outpost siege. You're not having to deal with two cards per turn, and then if one of those ends up being a storm breath dragon, you've exhausted so much of your resources dealing with the little things that now you've got big things coming at you, like a four mm -hmm. four, and it can monstrous, and you've got them drawing two cards a turn, and and yeah, the combined pressure was just too much and I remember being abs and control around that time and just feeling completely overwhelmed like I don't know what to do <laughs> yeah. well I mean I would say that like for me in terms of like you know the the way that I kind of take this card is it's probably if and I, I wouldn't say it's like straight bad I would just say that like um Thunderbreak Regent is so much better um oh, yeah. it's always upside always you never lose and this is a card that you really may you might want to play like one of it maybe two of it because you never ever want to play it and have to discard a spell have to discard right. an actual like you know you discard land who cares but like if you're discarding spells and then they kill it you just got x for one in a bad bad way but if it's the last card in your hand and you have that one copy in your deck then it's great it's you know it works out perfect they have to kill it otherwise you're gonna be drawing extra cards and that's terrific so i mean there's arguments to be made that like you know it's fine to run three or four of this kai because four is the top of your curve and you're going to be using all of your resources anyway and who cares but like when you have two of these guys in your hand mm, you know yeah. like then, then then it starts to hurt and then all of a sudden your threat you have to discard one of your other threats in order to have this threat so like i mean yeah you're going to want these dragons it is pushed in terms of like power and toughness for its ratio but the fact that if you ever discard a spell i think you just get completely hosed is is a is a real worry yeah, I agree. I, you're never going to run this card in a deck with Storm Breath Dragon. Right. This is the top end of a of a low low curve red deck. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the low low curve red decks don't really play four drops. They play maybe they play Rabble Master and they play Hordling Outburst and then they play like Stoke the Flames. Mm -hmm. and that's about it. They play Burn Spells uh, and and one and two drops and a couple of three drops. But they certainly don't play Avaricious Dragon and they certainly don't play Storm Breath Dragon. Right. And they probably wouldn't play Thunderbreak Region unless they're trying to have sort of a different angle out of their sideboard. Um, and so Avaricious Dragon doesn't really play well with other dragons, unfortunately. Huh. However, oh, it, it's it's got its own home. It's gonna it, this is good. This card's way too powerful to not find a home. Aaron? I can't help but be curious about it. Maybe in Modern Jund. Because I know Dark Confidant has been falling out of favor lately, and I know that some people were trying Outpost Siege, and we've already discussed how Outpost Siege is great for what it does, but it does just kind of sit there. And, hmm. I, I mean, it can't hmm. be bolted. I mean, it does let you draw can't an extra card. can't be either. It does let you draw an extra card. If you're discarding it, you could be feeding your Glaives. I mean, I, I'd be curious to try it in, in huh. John. I mean, I would certainly be able to try it. I mean, this also seems to me like a, a red sideboard card, which is like against the, the removal heavy decks or even against control where you like, you just, you know, you just keep running it out and they just keep killing your stuff and, and getting rid of your stuff. And then you're finally, like, okay, finally, this is, this is the last thing I play and you have to kill it or I'm drawing two cards a turn. That's I would try it, yeah. It's worth it. All right, so lastly, we learned that, or at least for the spoilers we're going to talk about this week, that Hicks's Prison Warden is a 4-4. Now, we all talked about it being like a 3-4. It would be great if it was a 4-5. It ends up being a 4-4. I think basically just traditionally because it's an intro pack rare, like they almost by default never do anything in standard. Yeah. They're always usually by default great bombs and limited. Um, so, you know, I think it's an absolute bomb and limited. I think it's huge and it's terrific. I don't really see it in standard because it can't block a Tassiger and it can't block a Siege Rhino. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, it's going to have to deal with some four fives for a lot of the future, and it's also going to have to deal with uh, Stoke the Flames being pointed at its face for at least Ugh. three months, depending on if that, that card gets reprinted. Um, it's it, Being a 4-4, four, four, it is a cool effect, mm -hmm. but it is not going to be a highly tournament-played card. It, it's in the same spot for me that uh, Yeva, Nature's Herald, is in. <laughs> Yeva is great. Yeva is so good. But it's a 4-4 four, four. Mm -hmm. with Flash, just like Hexus. But what do you mean? It's just going to die very easily, unfortunately. Yeah. It's, it's got above average stats. Sure. Um, but it's it's a it's a it's just gonna it's just gonna you know get run over by slightly better cards that aren't legendary. That's another thing that's holding it back is that it's a legend. It can't uh, you can't play four of them in your deck and expect to not be uh, have a couple games where you draw three of them and can only have one of them in play and you have this roadblock <laughs> happening in your hand. Right. Uh, anyone who's ever played four copies of Zergo Bell Striker in a deck knows that or Isamaru <laughs> or anything mm, like that. Dude, Isamaru was my homeboy. Yeah, but you'd you'd have opening hands that were like planes, planes, Isamaru, 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 two other cards, and you're like, well, this is what you signed up for when you showed up this morning, and that's that's what you kind of get with uh, with with legends that you want to have uh, uh, have a lot of. But it's a little bit of a different case here because this is a five drop. You're probably going to run fewer of them. Sure. As a five drop, it's best against tokens, uh, specifically those tokens made by Horling Outburst and Dragon Fodder. Uh, that deck still has Stoke the Flames. Sure. Once Stoke the Flames cycles out, this card might be a little bit more apt to see sideboard play. It's still mm -hmm. not going to see play against you know Abzan, which will be the top force in the format for the foreseeable future. Right. Aaron, how do you feel about it? I'm kind of a, I kind of agree with you. Like I I am curious to see what people can do with it. You know I I like to think that I'm a bit more optimistic when it comes to spoilers. Like not to be shady or anything, but I feel like you know when new cards come out, the default response is to find out what's wrong with the card. And I'm the type of person where when I see a new card, it's like what can we do with this? Like who can break right. this? So so when I see somebody like Jeff Hoagland look at Hixis and go. I'm going to do something with this. I'm actually really excited to see what they can do with it because I, I don't rule anything out because I'm the type of person where, you know, I'm not metagame girl. You know, I'm the type of person where if, if I look at a new set, the cards that I think are going to be big are never big. So I'm always wrong. So I try not to, you know, get too invested in what I think is going to be good because I'm always wrong. And I kind of like being wrong. So if somebody sure. can do something with it, Godspeed, I'm all for I, it. I've kind of been like, I don't know, sort of conditioned over the years to to be less and less excited about cards I get excited about because I've been proven wrong so many times and you know after after a while of being like I was really excited about this card and it was bad and I was really excited about this card and it was bad and I was really excited <laughs> this part and I was right and no one cares because I was really excited about this other card and it was bad right um so whatever I mean but ultimately like it, it's basically made me be a little bit more critical of spoilers in general there's sure. goods and bads in that but it doesn't make me less excited for magic it just means the cards that I like I try to be really critical on why I like them and why I don't and have better have better reasons. So, uh, so we're going to go into the red zone, and the red zone is a, a sort of the the hot a sort of hot button topic or a sort of a controversial type thing. And I think there was a lot of there was a lot of talk. We get a little bit serious on on the cast here, where there was a lot of talk regarding JVL's article this past week. This is uh, that's Jacob Van Lunen, the uh, one of the Sliver Kids, one of the guys who has been doing Magic coverage for a long time now. Um, you know, obviously Pro Tour champion as the Sliver Kids, and he was talking about Magic and suicide. And the fact that he had a suicide attempt and how his life changed because of that and how magic, what magic did for him when he was kind of in that world and the stigma that he kind of had attached to him for that point onward. And uh, it really resonated with a lot of people, which I, I certainly expected to, to do. Uh, the article was absolutely beautifully written. Uh, I thought it was great and one of the best of the year, not close. Um, but ultimately, I think it kind of brings us around and brought a lot of people around to like, what is magic for you? What did it do for you? And why are you here? Because sometimes... Sometimes it feels like, sometimes it feels like magic is like the island of lost toys, you know, and like, you know, like I, nothing else in my life was working. No other place was accepting me, but magic did. And Ruben, right. can, tell, tell me about sort of your experience with the article and, and how, how that sure. how magic affected you. Uh, I, I, I started reading tweets about the article before I read the article. I saw 10, 15 tweets saying JVL's article this week really hit me where I live. And I was like, oh, I guess I should go read that eventually. You know, but I was in the middle of some other stuff. I didn't read it immediately. I read it maybe two and a half days after it came out. And as soon as I read it, my heart just sank into my stomach 
and I just like sat in my chair after I read the article for a solid five minutes. Um, I never personally had an experience where I tried to kill myself, mm-hmm. but I have certainly had a lot of good friends that have uh, tried to or successfully killed themselves. Um, I am a depressed person. I am a clinically depressed person. And so having those thoughts and having um, uh, uh, moments where you feel like you can't do anything, that's, I know, I, I know what, that's, what that feels like and it's, it's not good. And his connection to magic um, really spoke to me on that level. I don't have the level of success he has at the highest, uh, at the highest levels, of course, but, um, but you don't need that. You, you know, magic is is really what you can make of it. And while there was a period where I was trying very hard to be, uh, you know, a professional tour magic player, there was a period, you know, and I like winning. I really do. Um, and I'm a horrible loser. And that's part of the part of the game that I really like is 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 trying to to uh, to uh, prove that I, on this particular battlefield on this particular day, I was the best wizard. Right. That's a that's a thing that, that appeals to me. Uh, after I, I had a soccer injury in college, in, in high school um, where after my soccer injury, I couldn't play soccer for a year and a half. Mm. And magic became my source of gladiatorial combat. That's where I went to show that I could uh, defeat other people. That's that's what magic was to me. Um, but it, it's also a place now where I, I didn't even think I didn't think I was going to enter Grand Prix Las Vegas. I ended up entering playing in the main event uh, and then I didn't make day two. I lost my winning in and I really didn't care all that much because thousands of these people that I've uh, interacted with on Twitter or had seen in PTQs in Ohio back when I was 15 or had met last year uh, were there and, and we were all hanging out and we could see each other for five minutes and catch up for a little bit or we could go you know, go out to the bar or we could go uh, over to a friend's house and play werewolf. Uh, we did, you know, I, 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 I palled around with Alex Hain all Monday, took him downtown uh, to the to the downtown container park here in Vegas because he wanted to see a little bit of the, the local uh, uh, flavor of Las Vegas, not necessarily just staying on the strip. And the, the, the camaraderie is really what brings me back to magic and uh, and and the, the the community is is the single most important thing to me as it is to JVL you know uh, in in his article he said that you know he wouldn't have won his pro tour without without the professor and the professor wouldn't have won his pro tour without without JVL and there were lots of little things in that article that that, that just stuck to me um, that were very that were like how did he did he sneak into my house and look at me and and read my brain while I was sleeping to write this article, because you know a lot of them really really stuck stuck with me. But uh, definitely um, one of my favorite articles of the year, uh, and in in not not so much a happy way, but not a sad way either. Just sort of a punch you in the gut kind of way. Like uh, you know you know you ever seen the movie Crash? It's like yeah. not happy. It's not sad. It just punches you in the stomach. Mm-hmm. and makes you deal with it. That's what this article was like for me. Aaron? Yeah, I, I I relate to Ruben in many ways. You know, I'm also a depressed person. You know, my depression channels itself a little differently. Like, I've never had suicidal thoughts. I, I have not had people around me that I know of have suicidal thoughts or, or successfully, you know, commit suicide or anything. Um, my depression comes from my childhood. You know, I was a sexually confused child growing up. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I was. And for me, you know, reading JVL's article reminded me of what I get out of magic. And like Ruben, you know, Ruben had talked about, you said, being around those thousands of people who you've interacted with. For me, it's the love. You know, I get yeah. showered with love for doing what I do. And when you're the unpopular queer kid who has no friends and no one wants to talk to you if you would have told me that I'd be 30 years old and cool and that (laughs) people would love me enough to vote for me to be on the community cup and that people would come up to me at events and like just the moments that people have said to me I've had people freak out when they meet me I think one of the warmest moments I ever had was at GP Chicago last year there was a woman named Julie who listens to my show and we kept getting sat next to each other at the GP and at one point like she kept looking at me like she might have known who I was and I kept looking at her like why aren't you looking at me and then at one point she breaks the ice and she takes my hand and she looks at me and she says I love your show and I love you 
and I'm just like, what do you say to that? You know, like, and then it wasn't creepy. Like, it wasn't in a sure. weird way. But, but again, coming from somebody, I never had that. You know, I didn't go to prom. I know, right? I spent so many nights by myself. I, I didn't, I wanted people to like me. That's all I've ever wanted. And to be at a point in my life where I am marinating in it, like the days that I can't get out of bed and the days where I just don't give a Velveeta slice of a damn what happens, I look at my Twitter or I, I actually keep the emails that I've received and it's like, you did good girl, you know? And like, it's things like that that help me go through the day. And I wouldn't have that without magic. Like I wouldn't know... I'm going to I'm going to go there. I wouldn't I'm going to be so bold as to say I wouldn't know what love is without magic because I'm I'm I I, w- I don't want for any more than I already have. Like it's just that awesome. So wow. So I mean, I'll I'll kind of I mean, if you took a lot of what your story was and replaced queer with fat, you would probably have a lot of what my life was as a child into adolescence. In terms of I was the fat kid, I was unpopular, no one, you know, like I wasn't one of the cool kids, the cool kids tried to make fun of me, blah, 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 and I just, like, it just made me slowly kind of turn into this self, you know, like, everything's bad about me, no one's going to like me anyway, this is terrible, I was a super depressed kid, it was really bad, Um, and, you know, and so it's weird, we're we're three depressed people now, aren't we? Um, So we can all relate (laughs) to that, like, really terrible feeling about yourself. That's Um, an interesting... I don't. I don't mean to interrupt you Go in the middle it. of your thing, and I'll let you finish in a second. But I think that a lot of Magic players, uh, that Magic: The Gathering as a culture and as a game attracts people who have depression hmm. because of the sense of community, because of the, how the game is a physical sit across the table from someone else and interact with that person with something that's made of of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, game. It's not an online game, right? It's not a game that. Uh, is is played with third party tools like chess. They're your cards, mm-hmm. and you're playing against someone else's cards, and you have a very personal interaction. You you know you sort of get into people's brains when you play magic against them. You see what they're made of. When you play against me, you see that I prefer certain styles, certainly, but also how I choose to play those styles. When you play against people, you get a, a you you understand them. Uh, perhaps better than you might just in a passing conversation. And so um, I think that a lot of people that crave um, uh, not necessarily friendship, but not a- non-animosity, people that sure. want to have human interaction with people that don't have any preconceived notions about them. I'm going to get paired against somebody that has no idea who I am and they don't know and I don't know who they are, but we're going to battle for an hour. Oh, it and was we're brilliant. We're gonna sit there and we're gonna chat and we're gonna shake our hands and and that's and that's gonna be a thing. Well, there was a couple yeah. points where, particularly in JVL's bit, where he was just like, he was known, he was this kid, he was known yep. as this. I was known as the unpopular fat kid. When I played Magic, I was good at Magic. No one knew me from school. No one had any idea who I was. All they knew is me playing Magic. All I could I could relate to them through Magic. We could I could make new friends through Magic. That was. That was just like this world that was that was separate, and the community was great, and it was inclusive, and it was something I could do, and I was good at it. And it was the more I did it, the more friends I made, and the sort of the, the further I went out with it. And even and even back, you know, of course, uh, like you know, sort of running through the adolescence into like having a real job, and then kind of coming back to magic later, and being like sort of getting that a wash of those feelings of man, magic was awesome. Like, and now I could like start doing like there's this whole culture of writing articles that just wasn't there when I was playing at first. Like I wasn't on the news groups, so I didn't get to see this stuff. The dojo happened, and I just I wasn't online enough to really see it happen, to really know that that was even a thing. And so, you know, like even in, in sort of my, my mid to late twenties, there, where I was like, I'm going to make magic content because I I'm pretty good at making this stuff, and, and I love magic, and I can just do it. And the more I did it, and the more I was just like, I love this so fiercely, I love it so fiercely, and all these mm-hmm. other people would give you that love back and just be like, we love it too. You like it, we like it, we like you liking it, we like you telling us how much you like it. It was it's it's brilliant and it's fantastic, and it it kind of it kind of brings you around to. Um, you know, to, to this feeling that I think JVL, you know, like he just, he opened up all of it. Like, you know, he didn't hold anything back in terms of the way he felt and the way people treated him and how much, how much love and, and, and respect and whatnot he got out of magic. And that, that to me was, it, it was really huge, both, both as a kid to have something I was good at and be able to make friends that weren't already, that didn't already know me as a thing, didn't already put me in a box. Um, and then later on in my life, as I'm able to sort of really just turn this into a career and that I just, I loved something so fiercely and everyone loved that I loved it. And that yep. 
more or less continues to this day. I do this because I love magic, not because I just want to like do something at 11 o'clock every Wednesday. Like, you know, I think you guys are awesome. I want to work with you guys because I think that we, we bring stuff to magic that, that, that is unique. And, and it's because of, it's because of our love for the game and love for the community. And that's, that's, that's really sort of all I can say about it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, so, um, and that kind of brings us to the other sort of sad bit we're just going to test from really quickly, which was revealed today, which is uh, Danny West wrote a brilliant, beautiful article called Life Totals. It's on StarCityGames.com right now. Danny is uh, Danny is a wonderful person. I don't know what else to say. Like, I've known the guy for many years. Um, like, technically, at this point, like, I'm his boss, and he works for SEG with me, with Cedric, in order to make the articles happen every day. Um, you know, I consider him a friend. I've known him for a long time, and it, he has cancer. That's terrible i mean you know um it's very frustrating it's very heartbreaking and it makes me angry but your anger at like the wind you know your anger at things that you have no control over you can only watch them happen and i don't have quite the connection that some do to cancer but aaron i think you can really kind of spell out that what what this disease does to people and how it affects you ultimately yeah you know i I have more personal experience with Danny's, the, with the subject matter in Danny's article than I do JVL's. My mom died of cancer. She died July 17th last year, so it'll be a year next month. Mm-hmm. And she was initially diagnosed with breast cancer seven years ago. And we come from a very medical family. We have lots of doctors and nurses. So when we first heard that it was cancer, we didn't panic because we were like, okay, stage one, stage two, can we beat this? What are the odds? And and the odds were good. So initially it started off being like a, a lower stage. And my mom took the caution of just just take the boob like let's just let's just get rid of it and that will you know increase my chances of beating it and we learned a lot of things dealing with cancer in you know one of the big things is finding your normal you know uh the other thing i i I learned was how people i guess the most important thing for me is to stay positive like i know it sounds really cheesy but we would get people all the time that would call and they would think they were helping. And they're like, I had a dream that you weren't here next year. And it's like, you don't tell the cancer patient right. you're having dreams. Like, you really do just have to keep it light and keep it positive. And, mm-hmm. you know, when we had to shop for a new boob, you know, we, we got to go through a catalog. <laughs> and, and it's something that people, and, you know, people could have made it really morbid and like, oh, I can't believe I'm I'm without a breast and this makes me less than a woman. Hell no, let's get the Viper A67. Let's get the best <laughs> model you can buy. And when the chemo happened and she lost her hair, we could have easily gone the route of, I've lost my hair. I'm not attractive anymore. I'm bald. Hell no, let's get you the Farrah Fawcett. Let's get a Foxy Cleopatra while we're here. You know, just constantly trying to keep it light because so many people, and they don't mean to but it, people just constantly drag you back to the you know what are you gonna do with the hair what are you gonna do when you're not here i don't know but we're not gonna focus on that right now and and you just really have to carve out your space and say this is the mood we're going to create here this is what we need to do to keep our sanity and to keep you going and and i kind of sense that in danny's post he was like you know what don't reach out to me i'm too busy you know yeah. and and you know because the because people would want to do that like i don't want to lose you don't don't say that to someone going through that just don't and um yeah it's it's just um yeah it's rough i mean you know and it's there's no easy answers and it's not like you know he uh, it's not like the, like they're raising like there's no so, sort of fundraising type thing going on or whatever it's just like he has it he wants people to know that he has it it's not the end of the world it's something he's dealing with it's going to happen he's not asking for sympathy he's just you know asking for people to just really kind of appreciate what they have mm-hmm. And recognize that, you know, and he, or he obviously does analogies to magic where he's like, you know, magic Which is, magic yeah. has ups and downs, life has ups and downs, he's on, you know, he, he's on a bad mulligan right now, but, yeah. you know, th- there's you're new games to be, be played. The, you're going to be on the crap side of variants every once in a while. Exactly, and, and yeah. unfortunately he's got, he's got a really bad one, but, you know, I, I absolutely believe he'll be fine and, and everything will be okay, and I want Danny in this world and whatnot, and just like everyone who's going through that, you don't want them to leave and yada yada. And, and it's not for me to kind of call him up and be like, dude, I hope you're here next week. You know, it's like, right. of course you it's are. Your, it's your job to make sure he edits articles and stuff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's yeah. the best thing for him. Like, seriously, yeah. just keep him working. Keep him, yeah. <laughs> Rump at him. 
That's right. I will grump that's, that's on. That's what you need to do. Danny's Danny's great. You've seen him on the Versus series. Uh, I don't know if he does those anymore. He used to do the Commander uh, right. videos every once in a while. He's just got this great deadpan comedy. It's brilliant. Uh, he's, he's got an announcer's voice, too. He's just oh, got yeah. this Super pleasing, deep. Yeah, pleasing baritone that just, mm-hmm. you know. He has beautiful. the number one video on the Star City Games channel. It's been viewed like 150,000 times. Really? It's where he and, um, and McDarby are trying to, like, one-up each other at the very yeah. beginning and like it's brilliant you should go just go to go I'll to go, look at that. go to yeah, youtube.com they, they, so the, they made quite the abbott and costello those two they they went they got along super super well and that chemistry was absolutely amazing so go to star city or i'm sorry go to youtube.com slash star city games go to the videos find the most watched videos it's at the very top you will laugh your butt off the first couple minutes are just absolute gold all right so we're going to move on here uh to pass the salt and this is where we get salty this is where things happen in the world and we need to talk about them and uh, there was a yeah, really we're interesting. Already all, we're all we're already all worked up and mad at, at <laughs> shouting at the void. Right now we can shout at something in particular, actual mm-hmm. things, which is you just other humans. And yeah, so started by Noah Bradley was a a sort of topic where he was just like, hey, there's some etiquette that you should have when you meet an artist. Like, don't put your drink on the table. Like, that's bad. Um, you know, you should tip them because they are rarely, if ever, actually paid for to be at the event. Um, you know, and generally they're just not, you know, take your stuff out of the binder before you get yeah. it to me. You wouldn't stiff a waiter. Don't stiff your artist, you know, say hi and thank you. It's like, it's weird to just like get a card and just walk off. Like <laughs> they are people, man. You don't like have to treat them that just way. Like pass the end I know. Like, just like, thanks dude. Or not even say anything to them. Just like hand cards and just like look down. Just like, don't do that. They're, they're real. Man. Um, yes. yeah, it's, it's, it's things. So. But but I thought was what was really cool um, was Aaron. You kind of had sort of sort of another bit of it, which is not just etiquette for the people talking to the artist and or approaching the artist, but the actual artists themselves. Can you expand on that? Man, you know, all right. I'm trying to word this as diplomatically as possible. I I agree with a lot of Noah's points. Mm-hmm. However, I do feel that the knife cuts both ways. And what I mean by that is, when I was at Vegas, there were a couple of artists who will remain nameless, who. I feel did not show that etiquette back. For example, there was an artist who was scheduled to be there at 10 a.m. one day. And when you're at an event like this, you are trying to squeeze as much as you can into the day. So some people love art enough where they will, they're happy to wait that long for things. Mm -hmm. And then there are those of us who we've got places to go, people to see, events to fire. We don't have that luxury. If you say you're going to be at your table at 10 a.m., we count on you being there at 10 a.m. Like I'll get there at 9.45 to get a good spot on your line, assuming that you will be there at 10 a.m. This particular artist, I waited 30 minutes. So 10.30, and we still hadn't seen this artist. Now, I could understand if it was they got there at 10.15, and I had to wait 15 minutes for them to set up. I'll wait until 10.30 for you. But 10.30, and I haven't even seen you. Like, there's not a single paintbrush on your table. There's not a single, oh, hold on, I'll be with you in a minute. That's a little unacceptable for me, where if you're if you're there to be professional and you're there to sell your wares and you want me to return that courtesy, you need to be there on time because that's just what I expect of you. And maybe that's too much. Maybe I'm too harsh, but I do think it goes both ways. It's too bad. It's just too harsh to expect them to show up when they promise to show up. I mean, it could be. You know, I'm, I'm open to the possibility that I'm wrong, you know, but I, I expect that of somebody. I was willing to, like I said, I waited 30 minutes and, and even, so I left the line at 30 minutes. I know people who stayed in the line at 45, 50, 10, 50 still wasn't there. Unacceptable. Mm, that's that's some serious daggers. Ruben, how do you feel about it? Well, I agree that the knife cuts both ways, but in this particular moment, we're going to talk about how we as normal humans and citizens should be treating the artists that illustrate uh, magic cards and also comic books and any other card games that we choose to play. Mm -hmm. So for this particular argument, I'm going to focus on how we should treat them. And and obviously everyone is horrible and they should all improve. And (laughs) I'm I'm perfect and thin and very good looking. But... No, the, the, the point is that uh, in, in our case, I think that there's a couple of important things that we can take away from this. Number one is if you're going to get your card signed, you need to know the tipping etiquette and you need to know the general uh, um, line etiquette as well. Don't bring, you know, uh, eight inches to, to 15 inches of cards and just present them to an artist and hope that they'll just sign them all for out of the goodness of their heart. They're there. 
they're not being paid to be there. They right. are making money off of what they sell. In fact, a lot of the times, they are paying to be there for their booth space, depending on if they're at a con or something like that. Um, so I, I think that it's, it, there's, a, there's a handy tipping guide, actually, lower in the comments of this thread that was... Um, well, the, I'll, I'll, general, let you, I'll, let you, I'll let you find that. While yeah, I while, while I discuss the the top comment, which I thought was absolutely brilliant by Noah, which is no, but seriously, if you put your coke on my table again, I will pull it. I will pour it all over your cards. So help me God. Yeah, that's and that's another thing is, these are their. It, it's not just that you're getting your cards signed. They are also bringing their prints. They're bringing their possibly their originals, right? Hundreds of dollars in one small piece of art. And so if you bring a potentially destructive liquid like a Coca-Cola or an iced tea and set it on their table within dangerous uh, uh, distance with people who are wearing giant backpacks and don't know how far back their backpacks go, they could be swinging around. This is a very dangerous proposition for them. So they've got this weird balancing act of trying to protect all of their property while also trying to be cordial to the people that don't really know how to treat them. And so the, the metric here that Noah uh, 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 <laughs> posted is for five cards, five or less cards, one to two dollars is good. Um, and then as soon as, as you go up from there, you should, you should scale up. Uh, it's a lot like, you know, any tip based economy. Like, uh, if you're, if you're at a valet, you should tip. If you're at a hotel, you should tip the, the cleaning people. You should always tip your breakfast waitress and all that good stuff. This is another type of that economy because I think that a lot of people just don't understand that. A lot of people don't think of, uh, just, they, they don't think about it. They're like, oh, I'm going to see one of my favorite artists. And I'm going to get all this sweet stuff signed and then I'm going to walk away for free. It's one and of those, that's, that's, mm. there's that expectation that they obviously got paid to be here. And right. that's just not true. It's just not, you know, because the artist has the opportunity to make a lot of money over the weekend. But they also, at this point, you know, and that sort of, as Noah explains, the opportunity to kind of get stiffed many times or kind of become jaded about it. Where, because people just, like, you know, like just say, say hi and thank you. When you don't do that, you you just don't even feel much like a person at that point. You're just like this weird thing to be used. Like, don't, don't, treat, mm -hmm. don't treat people that way. So... Yeah. One more thing I saw happen at GP Vegas a couple times with artists that Noah didn't cover in defense of the artists is it's very taboo to ask an artist to make an altar on another yes. artist card. So for example, there was somebody who wanted an altar where they wanted they wanted Eric Deschamp. I can name names. This isn't terrible. It's not the artist's fault. They wanted Eric Deschamps to add something to Tessa Envoy of Ghosts so that she was placing her hand on something that Eric had drawn. Hmm. So the person went up to Eric and was like, here's my Tessa. Can you add something to where her cane would be? And he was like, um, Carla Ortiz is just two steps down. I'm not going to do that. Right, and the person was sort of annoyed by that. They were like, I don't see what the big deal is. And I'm like, well, yeah. I do. Like, that's yeah, really exactly. awkward, you know? And there so are some artists also that will not do alterations on their cards. Um, and I don't fault them for that. That's their prerogative. You know, yeah. they're the artist. They have created a complete work of art. And now I want them to add a Pokemon to it, right? Or yeah. something, you know, whatever. Um, if, if they perceive that as, as an affront, that's fine. If they don't, also fine. But it's their prerogative. It's not ours to force that on them. Sure. So, uh, and, and certainly it's an awkward situation to put an artist in to bring them another person's art and say draw on top of it. It's a yeah. little much, I think. All right, so ultimately we're not able to, I think, get to every single segment that we need today because we're, we're, we're 53 minutes in and I generally have to keep this about an hour. So we were, so maybe we'll keep some of these topics for another time. Uh, particularly our going infinite section that we can talk about another time. The splash damage section section probably isn't going to have um, have as much uh, in terms of like we would come back to this. There was Pasco Maynard's right. Goif sold for fourteen thousand dollars. Obviously, he made the correct decision. Obviously, the auction was a brilliant idea, and I love it. Gamers Helping Gamers, the charity started by John Finkel and friends, uh, you know, gets half that money. I think that's fantastic. Um, there was this thing in the Washington Post where we talk about uh, an, an, a Magic the Gathering thief was caught in an elaborate scheme, or I'm sorry, an elaborate sting, rather. Not a scheme. Eh. Yeah. <laughs> um, but was caught in an elaborate sting because, you know, don't steal magic cards and be a good human being. Yeah. Um, if you have a chance to go read that article, definitely look up MTG thief caught in elaborate sting. Because, it was very clandestine. Yes. Yeah. Boy, is it entertaining how how the community came together to just catch some some scumbag who stole like eight k worth of magic cards from somebody. Yep. And uh, and, and 
Yeah. I will keep uh, the links will be down in the in the doobly doo uh, as they call it, and uh, the will will also link to the. Uh, the, it's the description. Um, <clears throat> in, in the description. Term. Yes, it's technical. Um, I stole it from PBS uh, something or other on YouTube. Uh, anyway, regardless, uh, they, there's also some good news, bad news, because there's another thread, again, link down in the description, where we talk about how the Washington Post did another article that has uh, some quotes from uh, Feline Longmore, uh, talks to Cedric Phillips, and but also kind of talks about magic in a weirdly negative type connotation of just like, you know, well, we're, you know, we're crawling out of the basements and like there's this like super niche hard super niche nerd hobby thing and they always kind of put it like in a positive light but it feels a little like backhanded it's, it's, comment it's patronizing for sure a lot the of the would call shade yes mm. well i don't think they're even doing it on purpose but i you know there, there's a reddit thread about it if you're interested in it um it's it's the washington post describes this as as a as a nerd something or other um and you know it's it's just it's just how 65 year old people look at pe- at young people and they shake their canes at us and say get off our sidewalks and they don't i mean whoever's writing the article clearly doesn't get it which is fine um and the the big cutaway for me is you know it's cool to be a nerd these days, man. I don't know where you've been for the last 15 years, but every major movie is based on a comic book. Every TV show has <clears throat> vampires and werewolves in it. Right. You know, uh, the, the magic movie's coming out soon. It's, it's, there's, there's not 16 candles anymore, right? It's all right. Firefly and the Avengers. Right. And so, I think, well, and I see this a little bit for, um, like, in my own life, because at this point I have kids. Kids are watching cartoons. The cool thing that is happening, if you're not a parent, um, are the people in their mid thirties are now the ones making those cartoons and they're mm-hmm. making all of the subtle references that none of the kids get. Like mm-hmm. I see back to the future references all the time in kids t- cartoon shows. I mean, I see stuff like, you know, the Godfather references, Rocky references, none yeah. of the kids ever even pay attention to this stuff. But if you're like, you know, in your late twenties and mid thirties, you're like, Oh my God, I can't believe they did that. And no kid ever realizes what's going on. They're just completely hamming up something else. Yeah. Those are all over the place. I accident. I'll say I accidentally, saw it but I was watching an episode of The Grim Life of Zack and Mandy and there was a fear and loathing in Las Vegas reference dude like they just had a drawing of Hunter S. Thompson in the middle of an episode nice. and they just do that all over the place It's, it's yeah. that's what you do if you're an animator these if, days if you like you know if you like that type of reference stuff my kids love Teen Titans Go I, mm-hmm. I love Teen Titans Go it's actually a really sweet show um, because it's good Aaron it's good I'm serious it's really sweet and Bubble Guppies are you a fan of Bubble uh, Guppies I've watched I my only, share I only watched Bubble Guppies last week because RuPaul was on it she was a snail named Rue Pearl. And See? I was, nice. That's, nice. They, they're just all I, about yeah. the popular culture. They're so I, in. They're I, so I, good at it. And no kids are even notice what's going on. They don't even right. pay attention. It's brilliant. No 12 year old knows who RuPaul is or no 6 year old knows who RuPaul is. Right. right? I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, it's great, and I think that's fantastic. So, all right, so we're going to go into the finisher. We're going to wrap up this episode. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about the magic movie. A magic movie poster was found at a licensing expo, and these are the places where people are like they want to make the underwear and they want to make the lunch boxes and they want to make whatever thing that is connected to this franchise because it's going to be a franchise. Which to us began to say like, hmm, what kind of like what kind of taglines, what kind of movie plots would you have? If you know a magic movie were to actually exist, and I'll save mine for last because I think it's I think it's super good, and I'm just aping the top comment off Reddit, and I will give credit. Um, but uh, but uh, Ruben, you want to kick us off with with sure. a potential option? <clears throat> okay, so there's we have the magic movie that's coming out, but uh, I think that there's opportunities for other magic movies to come out once mm-hmm. the first one comes out, and it's the most popular movie that's ever been made, and starts making TV shows and licensing deals, mm-hmm. you know, little action figures of all of our favorite characters, we're going to start seeing more, and I think that one of the first ones that we'll see is uh, is a Dak Faden movie mm-hmm. starring Winona Ryder coming this summer to a theater near you, The Greatest Thief in the Multiverse. <laughs> nice. Nice. The reference Aaron. from like 15 years ago, but... I took, Here we a more are. Un- I took a more unconventional approach to this. You know, I, I spend a lot of time going through Gatherer, you know, mm-hmm. trying to see what, you know, innovation I can make to my deck. And I discovered a card called Balthor the Defiled. Mm-hmm. And when I look at Balthor, I see Chris Van Meter. I see the long red beard. He's a stout gentleman. He's a perfect dwarf. And more importantly, you know, Balthor is all minions get plus one, plus one. He's raising this beard army. I just yeah, imagine man. this zombie bearded horde. And then, you know, when he dies, all the zombie beards come back. And I think that would be <laughs> fabulous if we call it, like, Fear the Beard. 
Nice. And nice. I'm in. If CVM were to be the zombie dwarf legend, I'm. I'll kickstart that. I'm. So yeah, down. I'd see that movie like eight times. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's uncanny, really. Fear the beard, sorry. Fear the beard. CVMs. All right. So it's very dangerous <laughs> over short distances. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I just lost my. Just had to do a Gimli impression for no reason. Yes. Nice. There you go. Um, never throw a dwarf. Uh, all right. So. Uh, I'm going to ape the, ape the top comment from GYS Hall, uh, who came up with a terrific description of a potential magic movie. This summer, Rob Schneider is a pro tour magic player, and he's about to find out that opening a foil tarmogoy from the top eight of a Grand Prix is harder than it looks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's Rob what... Schneider in top picks, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. see that because Rob Schneider's in it, but... That's this is the part where they go, Rob Schneider and foiled again. You know, like <laughs> foiled, again. foiled again's a way better name. I, like I that. still you know, I still have fantasies of, of one day magic getting to a point where we could do like a pitch perfect but with magic and have it just be this team of all female magic players and we go to like some big event and we practice and we take over the world. And that that's my fantasy for, for nice. one day. Nice. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So that ends another episode of Magic Mics. Thank you guys for joining us here to talk all things magic. I want to thank my co-hosts Aaron Campbell and Ruben Bressler, you guys for watching, and hope you follow, like, tweet, share, and do all the everything social stuff that people do to let us know that we exist. Catch us online at twitch.tv slash magicmikes every Wednesday at 11 o'clock Eastern, Twitter at magicmikescast, Facebook at facebook.com slash magicmikes, talk to us privately at magicmikespodcast at gmail.com, follow the audio-only podcast at magicmikes. Uh, podcast.libsyn.com or join us here next week same time same place for another episode of Magic Mics. Good night everybody. Bye.